coming to get changed here. And I apologize for the Phillies hat, but growing up in South Jersey, uh, I think we all know how our, uh, you, uh, our loyalties of youth stay with us for a very long time. Uh, I did have a Yankees Phillies hat from the 2009 World Series, which unfortunately the uh, Phillies lost to the Yankees, uh, but somehow I got left behind at a restaurant or a movie theater or something. Uh, for our presentation today, I'm happy to report that back baseball seems to be back, Major League Baseball seems to be back on track and they're in the midst of the uh, preseason right now. But I would like to take us back to a different time of baseball, a time before designated hitters, a time before division series. In fact, the first year that uh, postseason play began was 1969. Those of us who don't have too many memory issues may recall when uh, the National League champion and the American League champion, of which there were eight teams in each league, played in the World Series. That was the only postseason series. Uh, in October 1962, we were in the uh, midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the Major League Baseball team with the highest payroll, uh, it didn't identify the team. I think we can imagine it came from the Bronx. The team payroll was $576,750. That doesn't even buy you a good relief pitcher for a couple of years at, in today's market. But it is a, a, just a, a throwback to a, a much simpler time and for many of us a, a preferable time with regard to Major League Baseball. One other note since St. Peter's was mentioned, uh, in 1962 was also the first year that there was a women's college basketball tournament and that competition was won by Immaculata co uh, College outside Philadelphia. So we've come a long way since then. But now to bring us up to the, uh, the present, or I guess I wanted to use 1962 as a uh, reference point because our speaker this morning is uh, the co-author of a book about the Yankees in their dynasty years, or what most of us would remember, I guess, of the 50s and 60s, the, the year that the Yankees were uh, on top of baseball, no matter where else you were from. And John Seclair uh, will be telling us about a book he wrote with uh, a young man who became a bat boy for the Yankees. John was born in Brooklyn and he spent uh, many years in New Jersey since then, went to college at St. John's and he worked in a family business uh, that was a paper supplier and uh, provider, uh, often serving graphic arts industry. And he also served in a variety of other businesses over the years. As a youngster, John was a voracious reader and he attributes that uh, love of reading to how he developed an interest as an author. And with that, John, I think I'm going to turn it over to you and let you pick up the story from there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Steve Heft, Paul, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. So uh, this is a, uh, an interesting time. Uh, and for, for a very young man who was 15 years old in Little Italy in Manhattan, uh, he was given the gift of a lifetime. And uh, his, his, his father was the inspiration for him to be attracted to baseball, as well as playing baseball in the uh, streets of Little Italy himself uh, as a young man. So the story, um, there's a couple of stories within the story. I met Anthony Florio uh, in, in 2009 when both of us were working for different companies in the waste management business in New York City. And a very dear friend uh, said that uh, Anthony has a story he'd like to turn into a book. So we got together and I listened and I fell in love with the guy because he was such a real, real person 
and his story was very, very exciting. Uh, and it was, it was a different time. This is 1961. Uh, baseball was very important to young people around the country, as, as you gentlemen will, will appreciate. And uh, Anthony was um, gifted in this regard. His father, Sal, uh, coached Little League teams, or they were, weren't called Little League in 1961. They were called Sandlot teams. And um, he decided that Anthony would do better if they took the teams into the Bronx. So uh, while they played in the Bronx, uh, Anthony got a chance to meet Joe Torre and, and uh, Rod Carew, and they played baseball together. And, and the story of his uh, involvement just grew from there. Uh, but the, the one thing his father wanted him to do was to actually play, uh, play baseball in the Bronx. Now, you know, there's a restriction for you to attend a school in one borough if you live in another. So Anthony and his father and another gentleman were very creative and they managed to get a false address for Anthony, which was in the Bronx. So he attended James Monroe High School. And his story uh, kind of grew from there. And um, it was, a, a, I guess the athletic coach at James Monroe High School, uh, who uh, was also a, a scout for the Chicago White Sox. How and why he was in the Bronx as that scout uh, is another story. So the story of Anthony's introduction into uh, the big time for him uh, was, was a simple question to Anthony. Uh, I need to appoint someone as the ball boy for the visiting teams at Yankee Stadium. Uh, are you interested in doing that, Anthony? And that, that actually became the story of his involvement with the visiting team, with the Yankees. And uh, that, that's, that's what his story is about. And I'll do just one visual right now. Can everyone see this? A picture is worth a million words because uh, Anthony's hero, uh, along with a million other kids in, in America, was Mickey Mantle. And he had the ability to meet Mickey Mantle every day while he was at Yankee Stadium. And uh, they actually became very close. And <clears throat> one of the interesting things about uh, his being a bad boy in 1961 I'm sorry, in 61, he was the ball boy. In 62 and 63, he was the bat boy. Uh, back in those days, uh, Anthony Florio, and he was Tony the, the bat boy to the players, uh, was permitted to practice on the field with the New York Yankees. So, and here's one of the things that I've in, in my notes. Uh, if, if you read the book, you know, it's, it's the words, it's his story. It's written in the first person. Uh, it's, it's really a good, a good honest story of a, a young kid's life. But when he was telling these stories, when he was talking to me about doing these things, at the time Anthony was 61, well, he turned right back into a 15-year-old kid. And uh, his, his eyes, his body language was just, you could feel the excitement in every, in every sentence about every guy that he may have met. So uh, his, his experience, again, we, we try to compare, you know, today's uh, young sports fans with those sports fans back then. Uh, and it's probably still an enthusiasm uh, to, to work with a basketball team or hockey team or baseball team. Uh, but at that time in 1961, there wasn't a hell of a lot else to do because there wasn't any uh, technology, video games and cell phones and so forth. So you played ball on the streets and you watched baseball and you talked about baseball. And that's, that's really Anthony's story. He lived it. And to this day, let's say Anthony is uh, 76 now, uh, he still plays softball uh, and he, he's still in pretty damn good shape. And that, that's, an, that's one of the amazing things about him. 
but the, uh, the 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 part of the story, and again, he is the hero of the story. I was the mechanic. That's what I referred to myself as. Uh, Anthony was not uh, uh, technologically savvy, let's say. So this is how his story uh, was retold to me. Anthony had a cassette player. He would speak into his cassette player after work every night. He would give the cassette tapes to his son. His son turned them into CDs, and then they would mail them to me. I would listen to his CDs. I would pause and write notes, and then listen and pause and write notes, and so on. So the story that we started uh, putting together in uh, 2009 didn't turn into a book until 2015. So there were some interruptions in between, uh, but it but it did take some time to get that uh, in, into print anyway. And uh, what we would do, uh, uh, we, we had the opportunity uh, through a friend of mine uh, to actually be introduced to a, let's say a mid a mid list publishing company. I'll, I'll leave their name out of this conversation. And through that relationship, uh, we were given uh, what's called a developmental editor. Now that's a gift to, to, to get that far in the early days of trying to get a book published. And uh, what the editor did for us was immediately said, listen, I don't want to read about this story from someone else's words. I want it written in the first person. So when you read the story, it's Anthony's words, uh, it's his expressions, there's a few expletives, not not very many, uh, and uh, you know it's it, you you get a sense of what this young kid was going through, and seeing these heroes of the day, and um, all of the things that exist today that you can see on your telephone when you're on the toilet, uh, went on in those days, but you didn't see them as often as as you see them today. So there was. Um, anti-Semitism, there was racism, there was uh, prejudice, all those wonderful things that exist today, but they weren't broadcast. They weren't, uh, they weren't the story. Uh, they were just the background, if you will. So it, it all went on, but it wasn't necessarily uh, the most important part of, of his growing up in Little Italy. Uh, again, while writing the story, Anthony had a pretty good recollection but what we had to do at that point was kind of uh, trigger his recollection. And through the wonder of the internet back in 2009, uh, I was able to do some research, not Wikipedia, but through the Baseball Hall of Fame and so forth. So we could place Anthony uh, where, where a game took place that he attended that he may not have recalled, and then things would start to come back. And it's all true. And there probably are some, um, I won't say lies, but there are some colored stories that he may have embellished, uh, but it's his, it, it's his words, it's, it, it's his story. Uh, so so during, during his time with the Yankees, and as uh, Steve alluded to, a couple of things happened uh, that were pretty scary. And I think we all can relate to them today, and I know I can. So in 1962, uh, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And quite honestly, uh, it, even in conversation with Anthony, uh, you know, a 16 year old kid in 1962 wasn't paying enough attention to the threat that that crisis, you know, brought upon uh, the world. Uh, but but we, did, we did write about it in the book because it impacted what was going on around him. And similar to today, where there's a war raging, not in our country, but in another, another country. Obviously, we, we talk about it, we think about it, we pray for these people, uh, but it's not in our face, not, not enough. And that's kind of, kind of the, uh, the, the attitude I, I kind of got from Anthony at the time. He was paying attention to, uh, uh, to what was going on uh, in, in his own personal life. Uh, in 63, President Kennedy was killed. Now, there were conversations that he remembers in the locker room. But quite honestly, 
um, they just weren't deep enough. Everybody loved President Kennedy. No one talked about the Hatfields or the McCoys. It was just America. It was just uh, you know where we all lived, and we were all proud to to, to be American. Uh, so um, the impact of that had more of an effect, but it just didn't come down on uh, him, and maybe not on all the players. Uh, it was uh, more or less a sidebar. Now that's the truth. You know, I, I don't particularly like that, but it's the truth of how that kind of went down. Uh, some of the things now some of you may have recently watched the, the andy warhol uh, series on um, on netflix I, i'm not going to say i recommend it but it's uh, if you love art if you love uh, new york city if you want to see what was going on in those days watch it but uh you know one of the things that andy warhol is famous for is his uh his expression that uh, everyone is famous for 15 minutes, something along those lines. Anthony had those uh, 15 minutes a couple of times. So while he's a bat boy in Yankee Stadium in the 1960s, Phil Rizzuto would mention his name. Tony the bat boy, you know, caught a foul ball or ran to the sidelines or did something like that. Uh, he loved to entertain the, the, uh, the crowd, the fans got to know some of the fans, received lots of letters from the fans, and they're in the book. Some of them are funny. Uh, so he had that kind of um, attention. He loved it. Uh, he, uh, he was a little bit of a ham. He always describes himself as a skinny weasel of a kid. And uh, he, he, uh, he, he got a lot of attention. But it went a little bit further. Uh, no, no one really knew the story of how he lived in, in Manhattan and went to school in the Bronx. So while he was on a plane going back and forth from a, a out of town game, he sat next to Dick Young. And, you know, 15, 16 year old kids don't know from, you know, holding things back. He tells them the whole story of how he how and why he's playing. So uh, in 1963, Dick, Dick Young wrote an entire column about Anthony Florio and, and the kid from Little Italy. And that kind of blew his cover story. Uh, but they didn't fire him and he didn't get in a lot of trouble. But uh, he learned you know, to, uh, you know, to, to be cautious about who you tell uh, your, your, your life story to. He was on television. In the early 60s, he was on To Tell the Truth. And you know, it's a, he didn't make any money, but he, he had a great audience on to tell the truth. So uh, people got to know him. And um, again, during his life as a bad boy, some of the guys were not much older than him, two guys in particular, uh, Phil Linz and Joe Pepitone. And they, they were kind of guys that, I guess Anthony in 63 was gonna turn to 17, uh, so they would go bouncing, if you will. And um, he, here's one of the things that uh, the developmental editor, you know, really begged Anthony and myself for. Said, Anthony, listen, everybody knows these stories. You know, they've been written countless times of Mickey Mantle and Yogi Berra and Roger Maris and Jimmy Pearsall. You were there. You saw these things but you saw things that people did not see in the locker room or going out with some of the guys or maybe going on a double date and things like that what can you tell us that's more personal what can you tell me that's more personal that maybe is a sexier if you will and uh you know anthony sat back and he basically said i'm not going to do that i'm, I'm not going to most of these guys are still alive. I, I wouldn't want to embarrass anyone. So, so there, there were some great stories that Anthony told me and might, might tell you guys not on this device, uh, but they weren't going to go into print. And what would have made the book a lot better uh, is if we were able to stay with the developmental editor, it would have been turned into, a, I think, a better book uh, I think he would have encouraged Anthony to be a little bit more forthright about some things. 
uh, but he just did not want to do that. So the story of publishing went from a mid-list publishing company to self-publishing. And that was fine because honestly, I don't think Anthony ever wanted to, never thought about making money when he told his story. He just wanted to tell a story. He loves his story and he wanted everybody to know about it. So that gives you the ability to print as few as one book. Uh, and we went to a great uh, publishing company uh, in Manhattan called uh, McNally Jackson. And we went through the process and we actually sold some books uh, on their website, but they, it wasn't, you know, we weren't getting the traction that Anthony wanted so he decided to take it upon himself to print books and create his own website. So uh, to this day, uh, you know, Anthony still tells uh, his stories. He goes around the country doing book signings. And uh, he's, he's not able to be with us right now uh, for a personal reason that I'll, I'll just leave out of this right now. But he's still, he's still in great shape, good health. Uh, but uh, he's not doing public things right now until he tells me he's ready. So Steve, at some point, I, I, I would, if people are interested, I'll, I'll make an introduction and you could speak with him uh, directly. Uh, but that's, you know, that's something that I'll, I'll just hold on to right now. Uh, so, so the story itself, I like to say, uh, he's a wonderful guy, it's a true story. Uh, there are other bat boy stories. There are plenty of other kids in sports, uh, boys and girls who are involved in, with, with uh, professional teams. Uh, it's still an exciting thing for a young person. Uh, I love seeing kids that are, are still playing any kind of sports outdoors, uh, and that still goes on. Uh, but it was, um, it's his story, it's his life, and it was a privilege for me, really a privilege to get involved in this. Now, uh, as Steve said, uh, yeah, you know, um, I've been reading really all my life, and uh, I've been writing all my life. But I never, I never wrote a a book, you know, other than short stories, uh, you know, business plans, essays, speeches, that kind of thing. So uh, when I met Anthony, I was a capable writer. I, I, I always say capable, and uh, I thought that uh, this would be a great test for me to see how far we could take it. So. The process of doing this was another was another story in itself. Trying trying to get published, talking with uh, literary agents, having them hang the phone on you, getting rejection letters left and right. Uh, the, the first thing you do uh, is you leave your um, your ego at the door, and you, you get ready uh, for the onslaught of uh, of, of rejection. But that, that's okay, that, that, that makes you, a, I guess, a more informed person the next time you go around with it. So the process of writing, uh, going back and forth, uh, that, was, that was a great story. And I tell everyone I meet, and I tell every one of you gentlemen, and, and I, think, I think Steve Heft has mentioned this, I understand that many of you or some of you have, have written books yourselves, and that's the great, that's the great thing. And I encourage everyone to tell their story, if only to, to pass on to their children and grandchildren and so forth. Uh, let them know where you came from, what you did, what your great grandfather did. Uh, and um, that's something that uh, I, 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 continue to, I continue to do with people I met. So the story of Anthony Florio continues. I'm sure he's going to come around. He'll probably, you know, see what we're talking about today, and uh, he'll say, "Well, you should have said this, and you should have said that," and that's that's fine. I love Anthony, and and, and I invite that. But for um, for a young kid, and again, uh, in the in the forward of the book, he basically says, um, "Just imagine what it's like for a 15 year old kid to walk into Yankee Stadium for the first time in your life." you know, through the private entrance and, and see the caverns and the underground and the dugout and the ball field. He, he, he can talk about it today as if it happened this morning. It never left him. And I don't think it's ever going to leave him. So 
it's his story. I had the, the privilege and the honor to, to be a part of it. Uh, we tried to make it as entertaining. And we, you know, and we, we came out with something that we're, we're, uh, we're proud about. Uh, now, here's one more thing. After we wrote the book and after we thought we had edited it uh, properly and, and uh, done the best job and we got it out there, we started getting emails. That didn't happen that way. That's, that's not the first time this happened or that happened. And they were right. So we went back and said, Anthony, are we going to, are you, do you want to do a reprint? Well, I think he, I think he's thought about it, but uh, we waited for uh, maybe enough corrections, if you will. Uh, but there was there was nothing that was promulgated here as a phony story. Uh, he was there, you know. Uh, he, he heard someone say, uh, you know, play the harmonica louder. Uh, he he uh, he watched Johnny Blanchard get embarrassed beyond belief by the coach. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a victim of tricks by the Yankees, which is at the time was customary, including being hung upside down in the locker room uh, and just left there for hours. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a, 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 the fun side of it. But, um, but that's the... Uh, that's the story. And one of the things that I'd like to, to mention, you can get a copy of the book. You still can. So if you have a minute, it's nyybatboy.com. nyybatboy.com. I think for 20 bucks, you pick up a book. You, you know, you, you go through the uh, effort of, uh, of writing to the website and you get a book in a couple of days, I think. Uh, and... Um, I, you know, I would I would welcome that you know the, the that you did that because uh, it, it's his story, and the more people that know about it, uh, the, the, the better I feel. Uh, si si since that time, uh, I started writing another book, and it's uh, it's a work of fiction. I've just completed it, and uh, now now the hard part. So after a couple of years, eighty eight thousand words and 396 pages, the work begins. Uh, am I ever going to get it published? And we take it from there. So uh, number one, uh, I, I encourage everyone to, uh, to think about writing something, whether it's a cookbook, you know, whether it's a, a poem, uh, a haiku, wh whatever. You put something down, and, uh, and it's, it's a little bit of, of practice if you're not golfing or fishing. Uh, or eating, some of my favorite things. Uh, so, um, Steve, I, I thank you, gentlemen, for giving me a chance to talk about it. And again, I'll, I'll put him up on the screen. And and the uh, the picture is the book is filled with really great pictures. And and here's here's another thing about that. And I caution you: uh, we own the copyright, and we actually went so far as uh, to an attorney friend who's actually acknowledged in the, uh, in the book, uh, we developed an intellectual property agreement. So should, you know, someone come along and turn this into, uh, uh, you know, a great book or a, a great movie or a play or a musical, uh, you know, we would split the millions of dollars that would come forth, you know? Uh, so we own the copyright, but you also own the risk uh, because, you know, I was asked, John, did you get permission, you know, to put these uh, things in the book? And we were on that verge with the publishing company because if you went to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or to a legitimate publishing company, they're going to vet this like nobody's business. And uh, you better get your ducks in a row. So quite honestly, we didn't do anything. Anthony didn't say anything. We didn't publish anything self-wise or otherwise that was harmful uh, or, or would invite a litigation. We, we didn't do that. However, if somebody at the New York Yankees gets a bug up their ass and said, wait a minute, you, you, you're talking about things and you never asked us about saying that, well, since 2009, or actually since 2015, the Yankees haven't called Anthony or myself uh, 
uh, by the way, don't ask them to guys, but uh, they, they have, there hasn't been anything that, uh, that brought us any, any, uh, any trouble. Uh, but, but going, going forward, uh, you know, you'd have to get permission today. And uh, I was also asked, and then I'll cut off. I was also asked, did we, we try to go to the Yankees? Well, Anthony, you know, did meet with Yogi Berra shortly before he passed away. And, uh, you know, Yogi, his memory wasn't the same, but he kind of remembered Anthony and they, and there's some pictures in the book with Anthony and Yogi uh, as a young boy and as an older man. And uh, so we, I would say that's a liberty that we may have taken. Uh, someone did advise me or at least uh, counsel me and counsel us that if Anthony was in the picture, if he, if he was in the, uh, the article, you know, he has certain rights to, to talk about it himself. Uh, I wouldn't push that too far with the, 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 the battery of lawyers from the New York Yankees. Uh, but it's just a word of caution that, you know, the next time uh, we do something that's nonfiction, uh, you know, we, we, we check all the boxes, that kind of thing. Uh, so so um, that, that's, that's, again, it's, it's Anthony's story. He's a great guy. Get the book, read it. Uh, you could reach out to Anthony and, um, he, you know, he'd love to hear from you. Uh, and that, that's, I, I think, I think that's what I have uh, for, for right now. Uh, and I, I would invite any questions if there are any. So thank you very much, uh, Steve and Paul, for uh, asking me to speak in, in front of you great guys. Thank you. Thank you, John. Fascinating story. Thank you. You know, <laughs> Those of us who are very into online things, internet, email, websites, and so on, I remember that back when all of this was exploding in the world, and a lot of us thought, well, nobody's going to read books anymore. There's, you know, writing paper books are dead. It's everything's going to be online. And you know what? That didn't happen. Book sales are very robust. People are writing books all the time. I'm really aware of it because my wife and a few other wives of Old Guard are involved in the Summit College Club and they do an annual book sale where people donate books and then a few days later other people come and buy them real cheap. And, it, and it's getting underway now, so we're involved in this. And my goodness, if you put out a request for people to donate books, all kinds of people come out of the woodwork and bring, you know, cartons full of books and then people show up to buy the stuff. My goodness, people... I don't know if they read them all. Maybe they just buy them to give them as gifts and then take them to a book sale. But I, I think I think reading of books is still a, a very uh, robust exercise in this country. So look, if anybody else, um, uh, if anybody has any questions, please, uh, you know, raise your your uh, virtual hand. Mitch Erickson, you're first out of the gate. Hey, thanks a lot, John. Uh, maybe you, I missed it. Maybe I was sleeping or something. But did <laughs> did you actually? What the he, first time I put somebody to sleep? <laughs> did you did you mention how much did he get paid when he's being a bad boy? Very little. <laughs> uh, again, uh, I may have it in the book. It, it memory doesn't serve me right now. But I think earlier in the conversation, the idea of salaries in 1961 versus today. Uh, you know, one one of the uh, so so he Anthony was he was he was paid uh, you know probably minimum wage, but they paid for his airfare, they paid for his hotels out of town, uh, he, they, they paid for everything. I mean, they, they was they were big sports. There was always food there, uh, but uh, on that on that note, uh, while Mickey Mantle was you know kind of going out, if you will. Uh, they asked him, you know, said, so Mickey, what do you think they would pay you today? You know, Mickey Mantle today. And the story that uh, Mickey Mantle told was that he, he would just tell uh, the owners, hello, partner, because uh, he would be making those crazy numbers today. But, uh, but Anthony uh, didn't make a lot of money doing it. But he never paid for a ticket to get into Yankee Stadium either. No, sir. And, and again, uh, th those were the perks. Those are the great perks that he received. But if, if you asked him today, 
you know, what was the greatest thing? What was the greatest reward you got out of it? He'd tell you, and he woke him up in his sleep. He would tell you meeting Mickey Mantle. Having a catch with Mickey Mantle was just incredible. That, that's, that's how he got paid. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Steve Varley. John, thank you for a great story. Uh, thank you, you just Steve. talked about you just talked about how little Anthony made. Uh, my understanding was that the ball players to uh, make ends meet would uh, have to work in the off season in clothing stores, etc. Yogi Berra, if I recall, uh, that was the case. Uh, any insights on that? Yes, yes. One, one, of, a number of them. Uh, and again, uh, I have the book here. I'm not going to flip through pages. Uh, one of the guys, one of the Yan New York Yankees, was a car salesman. He sold automobiles in the off season, and another worked at a clothing store. But uh, every everyone, uh, you know, thought about, you know, that they weren't getting enough money, uh, but they weren't thinking about the uh, the salaries that you think about today. Yes, it was very very common. Uh, you know, I think there was. Um, I think one of the guys uh, owned a owned a, bub, uh, a bar, uh, so yeah, that was that was very common, at least in New York City with the New York Yankees. Uh, they they needed to make extra money. Yes, sir. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thanks, Rich Jager. You're next. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, a uh, your personal memories as as well as uh, Anthony's. Thank you, um, sir. Aside from the, the, the obvious change in the amount of money that's involved, uh, did he share with you, do you have your own reflections on how, how it's changed being, being out there as, as part of the organization? Um, uh, very different, uh, bat boys are no longer what bat boys used to be. Uh, what can you tell us? Well, in, in, in Anthony's uh, opinion, I think, the game itself, it's kind of, you know, um, it's kind of like the, uh, the movie, which the name escapes me right now. When they stepped onto the field to play ball, to this, to this day, uh, when those guys step on the field to play ball, they're still young men when, when you watch the games. That, for us, they're very young men. They, they love playing baseball. They really love it. And I, I would say, whether it's in the locker room or in their Lamborghini or, you know, somewhere in Paris when they're on vacation or something, they think about all of the money and all the fame and all the notoriety. But, uh, and, and I believe this too, but I think Anthony would corroborate this. When you're out there playing baseball uh, and a ball is coming at you with, you know, 900 miles an hour, whatever they do, they throw today, uh, you're in the game. You're, you're in the moment. And I, I don't know that there's not a player who's a, an asshole or a wise guy or, uh, you know, who's playing to the crowd. But I think Anthony would, would agree, and I, and I believe this too, that when you're out there playing ball, it's the 1940s, it's the 1960s, it's baseball. Uh, you've got to hit that ball and hit it as far as you can. So during the game, uh, it's very much like it always was. And someone, you know, some professional would have to say, that's not true at all, or you're exactly right. But I, I, I personally feel uh, that when that ball is coming at you, you're not thinking about um, your salary. <laughs> you're thinking about not getting hit by it. Uh, so, uh, and, and for a guy like Anthony to, uh, to continue to play ball, continue to talk about it, I, I, think, I think that's true of the real professionals in baseball today. And maybe, uh, you know, uh, if, if, you watch it, if you watch a game today, what's going through their mind at shortstop just before the guy hits the ball, that's really what it's all about. So again, that's my opinion. I think Anthony would feel the same way. And I think you guys might feel the same way too. Uh, when you're in it, you're in it. You're not thinking about anything else, at least for a few minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. Nolan. Okay. 
uh, just to repeat what I put in the chat before I ask my question. In 1961, I was 12 years old. I lived less than one mile from Yankee Stadium in the projects. My friend since age four, Mark Mayo, is still my friend. He named his son Mickey. You could get in the bleachers for 50 cents. So in 1961, I was in the Yankee Stadium at least 50 times watching ball games. A number of games, Mickey Mantle wouldn't start the game. He'd come up, pinch hit in the seventh inning, hit a 500-foot home run, and go back inside. My understanding is he was getting drunk and going out carousing a lot more than the public was aware of. I don't know if you could expound upon that, but it's kind of an open secret. And there's the famous story that he came into a hotel at 2 a.m. and ran into Casey Stengel. And Casey said, hey, Mickey, how you doing? And, and Mickey said, I'm drunk. And Casey said, me too. Also, of course, Mickey Mantle said famously in his later years, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of my body. But, but, but I'm curious as to what you can say about what went on after the sure. games. Sure. Well, I'm glad that you said after the game because, uh, you know, the other, the other uh, uh, story that went around was that when, when Mickey would hit the ball and he appeared to be uh, out of sorts, if you will, they asked him, how, how, did you, how did you do that? You know, he said, well, I, I saw three balls coming at me and I hit the one in the middle. Uh, you know, that, that, he, that he said. Well, number one, he was never drinking or drunk in the dugout when Anthony was there at that time. And uh, he would have told me that and I would have shared it with you, you know, off, off the record, so to speak. So he, you know, you know, I don't know today if anybody is, uh, you know, smoking marijuana and, and, you know, I have no idea. But in those days, and, and that's what I said earlier, stuff was going on, you know, since the Bible, okay? We just didn't have it in our hands to look at on a cell phone. So, so uh, uh, he may have come to the games uh, after a night out, he may have gotten there late. Anthony did put a test to that, uh, but uh, he was never, you know, full down drunk that Anthony saw, and and none of the players were like that. The, the the oddest thing that he ever witnessed was was Jimmy Pearsall, and because uh, he saw Jimmy Pearsall and his shenanigans, and what we say in the story, which is really common knowledge right now. Uh, they didn't know what to call it back then, but he was probably bipolar. Uh, he had, he may have had issues, um, but as far as as far as Mickey Mantle, yeah, Anthony had the great joy of you know having lunch and dinner and being out of town with him, and those are the things he he was not going to tell about. Uh, he 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 did tell me a, a couple of wonderful stories. I just can't tell you guys because uh, you know I would never do that, but uh, they were on the plane. Uh, they were in the they were in the locker room, uh, and it's it was really, you know, good down home stuff that uh, that he that he lived, and even the joking around, you know, no, nobody gave him a tattoo while he was sleeping, or but they they did put a mustache on him with a magic marker, and you know he couldn't he had to use Brillo and he still kept, couldn't get off get it off his mouth, uh, but. Uh, to, 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 to go back to what you asked, uh, yeah, he he knew about that kind of thing. And by the way, it was not just Mickey Mantle. No. It wasn't just Casey Stengel. No. But no. No. the guys that like like one, one of the one of the great uh, stories he remembers is Bobby Richardson. He was he was, you know, you you got what you saw. He was a great, great guy off the field, on the field. Mm -hmm. He was a man of the cloth, if you will. And I think it was a kind of preacher, if, if, I, if memory serves me right. So it was it was true from what you saw on television and in the, in, in the stadium. Uh, but there there were some characters, and you know, for the most part, what's written about you know Joe Pepitone, what everybody knows about, it's all true. Mm -hmm. Ant Anthony could embellish those stories and corroborate them and and make them better. Uh, but he he wouldn't do that, you know, in, in writing. So uh, yeah, Anthony, yeah, they, that that went on, but not in, not in the game, not during the game. No, he never saw any. Maybe they chewed tobacco, it was about as disgusting as it got. 
Sorry if anyone still does, but uh, no, there was there was no no carrying on during the game. No, I was asking about after outside the game outside, but I guess it was just everybody got drunk. Every night, cold, cold. every night something happened after the game. Yeah, and and, uh, and every yeah. you know again, uh, don't forget he's 15, 16. They didn't take him along, and there are some stories that in the book that he he, he does tell about. Uh, he became very close to Tony Kubek, and they roomed together. Uh, you know, and that's 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 the great thing. Um, these are names that that you guys that I I I remember. He was he hung around with them, and um, you know th there there are some great stories. I, I'll I'll tell Steve some at the next uh, family gathering. Then he'll share them with you. But they ain't going on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Do that. Um, actually, we have a, a, a sports forum here at Old Guard uh, where they talk about things like that and everything else having to do with sports. And, and since I mentioned that, I'm going to jump forward in the queue just this one time and ask John Baxter to, uh, to weigh in. John. OK, can you hear me? He, he runs our sports forum. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, thank you for a very nice presentation. Very well. I'm interested in the 1963. He was the bat boy, and, and in 1963, the Yankees had a very, very good team. But Burra yeah. and Mantle and all the other ones were starting to break down. Correct. And in the World Series that year, they, uh, they lost, even though they were heavily favored to the Brook or Los Angeles Dodgers four games to zero. And that was probably the most depressing day for Yankee fans. Did he mention that in his book? Yes, he did. And, and it's, it's a very poignant part of the story. Uh, it, it was his last uh, time with Mickey Mantle in the locker room. And Mickey Mantle was absolutely devastated by the loss, devastated. Now, Mickey Mantle, from what Anthony explained, was, was a kind of Gary Cooper kind of, uh, character. Yeah, he was a farm boy lifting bales of hay and you know pushing mules around, if you will. Uh, so he wasn't, at the time, wasn't a big talker. And uh, he was so devastated that uh, it, it might have come to blows in the, in the locker room when one of the, uh, uh, he was, someone tried to interview him in the locker room. And, uh, you know, we write about it in the story that, um, you know, the guy had to get out of there real fast. So uh, it destroyed, it destroyed Mickey Mann. He, he felt horrible about it, that he, he should have done better for his team. Uh, you know, he, he believed that. He, he loved what he was doing. So, uh, yes, it's, ver it's very much a part of the, the end of, the, of that career for, for him. And it, you know he wasn't going to go out on a high note, and that that was a sad part. And and Anthony did become very close with Mickey Mantle, and this is this is a thread throughout the story, and, and you'll you'll pick it up. Uh, Anthony's father was extremely uh, uh, instrumental in in Anthony's uh, getting into this whole thing. Uh, so was Mickey Mantle's father, and and uh, what what Mantle. Well, again, I think this is common knowledge, but he may have imparted more of it to Anthony. Um, you know, they, they didn't get along with their fathers so well, including Anthony, including Mickey. So um, I'm a father. I have two daughters. I have two grandsons. I I want to believe that we that we connect, that we communicate. Uh, maybe when they were, you know, 13 and 11, I, I may have been like a slave driver or a monster to my young daughters, you know, so maybe we lost a little communication. But boys and their fathers sometimes lose the communication. And um, Anthony did feel that way at some point, and so did Mickey Mantle. Uh, they were pushed. Uh, they, you know, they, they were pushed into doing better all the time. Uh, and uh, so Mickey, Mickey Mantle felt uh, he let his father down, he let himself down, he let the team down. And it was very, very devastating. And I and, and we wrote about it. And Anthony Anthony remembered that vividly. 
And it's, it, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good time. It just wasn't a good time for Mickey Mantle. Well, thank you, John. You're welcome. Okay, so let's see, uh, Mike Martin. Yeah, uh, I have a brief comment and a question. Uh, one is, I, I read the um, biography of Mickey Mantle, I think The Last Teenager, and humorously he commented on, this is post-retirement, he was he was told that his jersey sold for $250,000. He commented that for an additional 5,000, they could have gotten me in it. So that was kind of his <laughs> sense of humor, <laughs> which, which I enjoyed. But on a serious note, uh, what was the commentary by Anthony about the relationship to the Dodgers and that rivalry and the departure for LA? Was there any uh, comments in the book? I, I think I think he may have touched upon it. We may have touched upon it. It wasn't as sensitive as it might have seen outside than it was inside. There was there were rivalries. Uh, but there seemed to have been, at least in Anthony's viewpoint and, and my interpretation, there was a respect. Now, Anthony hated the Dodgers like nobody's business because they beat the Yankees. But he never saw anyone in his days throw a ball like Sandy Koufax. He, he had such, Anthony had such tremendous respect. But from, from throughout the story, throughout the, um, I think throughout his life, the rivalry was maybe more of a perception than a reality with, with the teams, uh, I, at least in the 60s. And again, you know, this, you can't, nothing is absolute, nothing is axiomatic. The, things, things happened. There were guys that hated each other. However, uh, Mickey Mantle had tremendous respect for Willie Mays. Uh, he had res respect for, for Roger Maris. They respected the teams. Uh, I, I don't know that, um, I don't believe that um, unless what you, you may have read a, a personal account, that wasn't Anthony's experience. There was no hatred. There was no bias against the teams uh, other than, you know, a fan hating the Red Sox or the, the Giants or something like that. So uh, again, I, I, I don't believe that was the case in reality during Anthony's time there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we have one question left, and uh, it's uh, 11.32. So unless somebody wants to ask more questions, Ron, I guess you'll get the last question. Hello, Ron. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, did did uh, Anthony say anything in his book about the relationship between the players and the press? Um, there was, there was a, in those days, uh, they, they just didn't push it as much as they would push it today. And the example I used was, um, you know, guys got in, guys got in the locker room. Uh, there was some kind of uh, communication between them and the press. Uh, they, he, di he didn't cite anything, as I recall, that was sensitive or, uh, you know, emotional. Uh, the, 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 the sports writers like Dick Young, uh, they, um, you know, they, they may have gone to the line, but they never crossed the line with the players, uh, at least at least as I recall Anthony's recollection of their uh, relationship with the press. Uh, I think it was, I just, that, that word is to me is, it was most common throughout the story. We don't say it that much, but that's what existed. It was, it was just different you know, than it is today where they would catch a guy doing something bad and put it on the front page of, you know, him doing something. Again, it happened. Everybody did something they shouldn't have done, but it didn't go that far uh, to, to, at least to my recollection. Uh, so I think there was kind of a re mutual respect that, that, uh, that I can recall Anthony talking about. Thank you. You're welcome. Steve Heft, yes. we hand thank the mic you. back to you. Okay, John, I thank you very much. You're very for, welcome, uh, Thank you for enlight having me. Enlightening us. Oh, it was a pleasure. And uh, in the old guard, we have two ways of expressing uh, our thanks 
to uh, our speakers. Uh, number one is through a certificate. You'll be getting a copy of. Thank you. Uh, it's a certificate of appreciation. And you'll notice that on the lower left is a graphic of an orchid. And the significance of the orchid is that uh, when the old guard was, was founded in 1930, uh, Summit was in fact the orchid capital of the East. So it was used as an emblem of the old guard. Thank you. And the second uh, way that we say thank you is through an old guard salute. So if everybody is will unmute, unmute and say thank you very much. Thank you all, Dan. Thank you very much. Before thank signing, you. before signing off, I would like to say John is not the only. Uh, there are many talented members of her, his family, but his wife Dorothy is a gifted artist. Thank you. Uh, whose painting, many of whose paintings were. Uh, shown in Overlook Hospital not too many years ago. We had the pleasure of, of seeing that exhibit. Uh, thank so you. We're thank you very much. For us. Thank and again, you. thank you, John. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John thank you. and Steve, thank you so much for uh, a fascinating and entertaining talk today.